My name is Dan Gilbard. I'm a professor of sociology at Bristol Community College. I'm also the chair of the Multicultural Committee. And we have, um, this is the first of several programs we're going to be having this semester. And um, the topic for today is on racial profiling. And I'm going to leave it to our speaker to talk to you and have dialogue with you about what that is, what the issues are with it, and what needs to be done. But Keen Downey, who is our speaker, we're lucky to have him. He's somebody that's been a leader in the movement to address the issue of racial profiling. Uh, and he's now based out of New York. He came up here to have a chance to speak to the students at PCC. He already spoke yesterday to four classes at the Adelboro and Bedford campus and in the evening. And now today uh, at this hour and the hour following. Uh, the format that's going to be included will be There'll be a, a short uh, DVD, uh, there'll be a PowerPoint, a lot of dialogue, and plenty of opportunity to ask questions. So feel free to bring up your, your views and to go back and forth on the issue with King Downing. Um, there will be an evaluation form I'll be passing out in a few minutes. Um, you just take one and then at the end fill it out briefly. We always like to know how people are responding to our events. So uh, without spending any more of your time, uh, let me introduce King Downing. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Good luck. So, good morning to you. I'm, I, we kind of misled you a little bit, although he did tell you this time. Um, a lot of people thought that I was just going to come up here and give a talk, and I don't like just standing up here and talking. I think that's boring. Um, you got enough of that when you're in school already. So. I really want to have a conversation, and there are two reasons why. One is that one of the ways that I learn about what's going on with racial profiling is that I hear from people all around the country, and I get feedback, and that's how I know what's going on, and I know how people feel about it, instead of just talking and maybe leaving it to a Q&A. So I hope you have your class participation. Uh, any, any of the uh, teachers here? Are any of the teachers here? Is anybody giving any credit for participation? Uh, okay. All right. If you're giving credit for participation, hold your hands way up so they can see that. We're looking for people to comment and not just sit here, sit here and vegetate. Okay. Um, so one of the other things I'd like to do is I'd like to get an idea of what majors are here. And I've tried to do it in the past where I just asked everybody to say it, but then we just ended up with a lot of noise and I couldn't hear. So um, if you just raise your hand, and then I'll pick you, you name your major, and then I'll have everybody else who's in that major also raise their hands too. So who's gonna be first? Okay, right here. Criminal justice, where are my criminal justice people at? Make some noise up in here. All right. All right, who else do we have? In the back. Say it again. Communications, any communications people here? Good, good. You gotta stand up for your major here now. You know? Who else, who else do we have? Way back. Culinary arts. Okay, we like to eat. We like to eat. Don't forget that. If you don't eat, you can't live. You can't solve any problems. Well, all right. Nursing. None of your students are here? <laughs> all right, okay, anybody else? Human services. We have the teachers here. Are they all, any, any human services people here? Okay, who else? Yes. Engineering. engineering. Are you engineering? Where are the engineering people? All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Yes. Pharmacy. No, I'm not saying I'm in pharmacy. That might sound bad if it, you know. So, um, all right. So let me, let me just ask the criminal justice people, since we're talking about a criminal justice topic, uh, where are the criminal justice people? Raise your hand, they wanna ask you something. Oh, all of a sudden now there are less hands, see? Okay, <laughs> some people just dropped out just because I was gonna ask them a question. Come on, hold your hands up. Okay, I'd like to get an idea of, of uh, what some of you are planning to do. Uh, I wanna try a homicide detective. Homicide detective, how many future detectives do we have here? But you, come on, come on, you can change your mind later, it's all right. Okay, who, uh, other people, what other areas? Yes. Uh, officer, patrol officer. Patrol officer, police officer, future police officers here. Okay, any others? Corrections. Probation. 
prosecutors, defense lawyers. Oh, hold your hands up, the, the defense people. Okay. All right. Keep them up. Keep them up. This is the only exercise you're going to have to do. I just want to see who, who you are. The reason why I bring this up is in a lot of criminal justice programs, a lot of the majors tend to go towards the law enforcement and prosecution side and very few people on the defense side. So we want to welcome you as well as everybody else. Now, we're going to have a conversation here. We're going to have a conversation on a topic where there are usually two sides to this and there's a lot of middle ground. On one side, there are people who are saying racial profiling, I was profiled, it goes on all the time. And on the other side, we have people and agencies who are saying, we never do it, my officers never do it, it just doesn't go on, you all are wasting your time. The truth is, it's somewhere in the middle. And it's going to take people who are doing all kinds of work to get to identifying the problem and solving the problem, because it's not just about the criminal justice people. Everybody has to give input, and everybody may be subjected to it or have friends that are subjected to it as well. So uh, I'll let it go with that. Oh, other than my training is as a lawyer, I spent many years doing this work around the American Civil Liberties Union, which advocated on behalf of people who felt their rights were violated. That didn't mean necessarily that we were biased about it. We took our information to the juries in the court of law and the juries in the law made their decision. It didn't matter what we thought when we took somebody's case forward. Same when prosecutors and, law and uh, police officers bring their cases. We don't take the position, it's the courts and the juries that decide what actually happens. And in the case of racial profiling, it was a different situation because this wasn't always going to court in terms of systemic racial profiling. An individual can go to court, some class actions, but in order to avoid that, other processes started to go underway that were more about people sitting across the table and looking at data and other things, and that's what we'll talk about. But we might as well do this by getting an idea of what this whole scenario is like. Let's start out from the eyes of people in the community and the police officers and look at how the encounters happen. Here is Stone Phillips. Good evening. Discrimination, hate crimes. Issues that break down along the are racial divides among most of the nation. In recent years, another such issue has ignited even more controversy. Racial profiling. Law enforcement officers allegedly stopping and searching vehicles based on the race of the driver. Many African Americans say it happens every day, calling it painful and humiliating. But um, these the only advantage of the DVD player was that it was truly not color coordinated. They might have spent more than a year trying to find out why the driver was black or something like that. Many are not willing to be happy with what we found. Here's John Larson. All cities have to take a look at Cincinnati. Cincinnati is a mirror of many of our cities. If Cincinnati, Ohio is a mirror, no one liked what we saw in the mirror one morning in November. For six minutes, Cincinnati police officers beat an unarmed black man. Although the coroner would later say the beating led to the man's death, in the eyes of the mayor and the county prosecutor, the police action was justified. After all, the 350-pound man high on drugs had attacked the officers. The police officers had a legitimate interest in making absolutely certain that they protected their own lives and their own safety. I don't see him breathing. But not everyone agreed. You see, in Cincinnati, which is mostly white, on-duty police there have killed 18 people in nine years and every one of those killed has been black. We know that white kids run from the police. We know that white people fight police. In this city, they just didn't end up dead. Cincinnati's Reverend Damon Lynch claims what many African Americans believe, that every day, without any cameras rolling, police treat innocent African Americans as suspects, as if they're guilty until proven innocent. It's called racial profiling. And the President of the United States has pledged to bring the practice to an end. Racial profiling is wrong and we will end it in America. Tonight, the culmination of a 14-month Dateline investigation of racial profiling. New and compelling statistical evidence gathered from Cincinnati and cities across the country. 
Do police deny millions of Americans the most basic protection promised them in the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, equal protection under the law? Or are charges of racial profiling exaggerated or completely false? Hey, what's the problem, man? She's got a reason. We begin on the streets of Cincinnati, Ohio, a city torn by allegations of racial profiling. Hey, put your hands on the car or you're going to go in cuffs, man. Here, police officer Ron Dammert works one of the nation's roughest neighborhoods. Over the Rhine. In one year, nearly 400 robberies, more than 200 assaults, 10 murders in one small, overwhelmingly black inner city neighborhood. Most of this crime fueled by the only growth industry in sight, drugs. Each block has its own personality. It'll either be marijuana, crack cocaine, there's uh, heroin down here. The drug trade down here, it's all because of the money. On the blocks he patrols, drug dealers try very hard not to get caught. Lookouts on each corner announce the presence of cops. The boys! Boys is the code name for police, a warning for dealers to suspend their trade. The boys! It's just the way the game is played. The dope dealers will tell you it's a game. Don't hate the player, hate, hate the game. Increasingly, police in Cincinnati and across the country have been credited with winning the game, reducing crime, not by sitting back and playing defense, but by playing offense. This alley that we're going back to right now is a popular place for uh, people to smoke crack. Yep, there's two right there. And playing offense is called proactive policing. She just dropped something. Sit down. Sit down. Now watch closely. What are you guys doing back here? Dammert hasn't seen any crime being committed, but he says he saw the woman drop something. And he knows, according to the U.S. Supreme Court, if he has a reasonable suspicion, he can begin a search. You don't have any problem if I search you, right? You're not wanted, sir? No, I'm not. The men are searched and released. He then turns his attention to the woman. See, I told you you put something on the step, didn't I? Ma'am, I saw you put it on the step. Yeah, I did. Turn around, put your hands behind your back. He had found a crack pipe right where he said he saw her drop something. She's a relatively long way away. How could you see it? It took me a long time to learn how to catch people. A hunch and a small victory, albeit very small, in the drug war. If you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, I'm going to try to stop it. In any given year, police stop millions of Americans. But it's who they stop and why that's at the heart of the racial profiling debate. Okay. We've been labeled as racist, and I wholeheartedly know that that is not true. Does anybody honestly think that I would work in a place that is overwhelmingly African American if I was racist towards them? Nonetheless, you'll soon see how even with the best of cops, and Officer Dammert is that, hand-picked by the department to escort Dateline. How even with Cincinnati's finest, aggressive, proactive policing can breed anger and charges of racial profiling. Okay, guy in a black hoodie right in front of Albert's Market just saw us and headed straight into the store. Officer Dammert has just seen a young black man in a sweatshirt turn away from him and decides for that reason alone the young man is worth talking to. Can I talk to you for a minute, sir? How you doing? Do you have any ID on you? Do you have anything on you you shouldn't have? You look like you're trying to avoid me. No, I'm on the phone. No, you saw me coming and you took off around the corner and then saw me and started walking again. You got some weed on you, man? It's just a ticket. No, 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 no. It's called stop and talk. Ask a few questions, see if he'll consent to a search. It's all perfectly legal. You ain't got no warrants, right? How much money do you have on you, sir? Okay. You got a job? Where are you working at, sir? I mean, I was working at McGovern. Oh, okay. Spread your legs for me. The man has done nothing wrong, hasn't broken any law, but does he fit a certain profile? Well, if you didn't do nothing, man, you ain't got nothing to worry about. Okay, and I do, I do appreciate you cooperating with me. All right? Too short, all right? Just out here trying to get dope off the street, man. This is how we do it. 
Short thanks for your cooperation, Mayor. The young man is let go. No incident report is filled out. There'll be no record the stop ever happened. He saw us come around the corner and he turned and started to walk away. Was this racial profiling? Not in the eyes of Officer Dammert. I thought he had a warrant. I thought he had marijuana. One or the other, maybe both. You're saying I thought. You mean, in other words, you're, you're taking an educated guess? <clears throat> yes. Based on the fact that he turned away? Based on the fact that I've worked in Over the Rhine for five years. How important was it that he was dressed in a hooded sweatshirt, black, standing on the corner? Didn't mean a whole lot to me. His race? No. It was his activity, what he was doing. He saw me and immediately turned away. Is that reason enough to go stop him and eventually search him? Uh, no, no. We showed a tape of the incident to Cecil Thomas, a Cincinnati cop for 27 years, who now runs Cincinnati's Human Relations Commission. That's good enough reason for you to, to maybe uh, go around the block, call your undercover units, and say, hey, I got a guy acting suspicious. You think you can come over here and stake him out and see what he's up to? Anything further than that, you're really on thin ice. Thomas says isolated stops like this may seem minor to white Americans, but he says in the African-American community, they happen far too often. Are Cincinnati police profiling people racially? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you just saw it in that film. <laughs> in the film, you just seen it. The same day he was stopped and frisked, the young man arrives at police headquarters, attempting to file a complaint that he'd been profiled and harassed. Do you think I harassed you? Yeah, I mean, oh, I, was, come on. I, I was on the phone. Was Dammert's supervisor joins them, and Dammert, saying it was not racial profiling, tries to explain the law. You turned and walked again, twice. You turned and walked away from me. That, in that neighborhood, gives me reasonable suspicion to believe that you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. The young man tries to explain what it's like to be stopped, searched, and embarrassed on the street. He asks four separate times to file a complaint, something entirely within his rights, but the officers won't hear of it. Well, you're, you're talking to my boss right now. I don't think he's going to put it on paper because there's no, there's no violation here. I mean, I actually have a record to go to and down. They even suggest there might be legal consequences. Great for me. Do you understand there's such a thing as filing a false police report? Do you understand it's a criminal charge? If you, if you try to go through with this and they bring that tape in and they find that you're lying about what you're saying, you know you'd be charged with that? He never files a complaint and leaves feeling his concerns were neither heard nor understood. Okay, so does anybody have any reaction to any part of what you saw on the film? Any part? Okay. I do. Uh, when he was searching him, obviously it takes place so often now that it didn't even phase the guy because he was still on the phone talking. So obviously it happens so often that they're almost numb to it, which is pretty weird. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Why? Why? Because. You don't see white people doing that. Like if you're walking around, you don't see them getting stopped or anything else or being suspicious. I mean, you just don't see that. That's just not normal. Okay, I'm going around asking folks. I'm not going to comment on it. This is an open forum. You can um, say whatever your response was. Go ahead. I think a lot of it also depends on the way you dressed your appearance. What, you know what I mean? If you look like you're out there, like if you dress like a troublemaker, you might be a troublemaker. How does a troublemaker dress? When I was younger, the same things happened to me. And, and I'm white, you know what I mean? Looking suspicious, dressed like kind of like a punk, loose clothing, hood on, cop stops, talk to you, you still stay on the phone, that's a sign of disrespect right there. You know what I mean? That's, that, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a underlying combativeness. What's a punk? <laughs> no. it's, it's, it's appearance profiling rather than color profiling. A lot of the time, not all the time, but I think some of it is appearance profiling. So... You know, if you're not dressed in normal, regular business attire or regular, you know, casual clothing, then I think a lot of police officers might assume that you're out there causing trouble. 
Well, what if dressing like a punk is your casual clothing? Or what if, well, I won't say if it's your business attire, but what if it's, what if that's the style that you happen to like? Uh, I, that, that's fine. I, I think as, as officers, though, they look at that as, as a problem. Not, not that I look at that as a problem. I'm saying it's happened to me, too. I think it's, a lot of it's been based on my appearance. Okay, so we kind of, anybody, what about appearance? Can you, does, well, well, first of all, what's required in order for somebody to be stopped? Under the law, what's required? What'd you say? Suspicion. What kind of suspicion? Ridiculous suspicion? Uh, fantasy suspicion? Uh, su suspicion? Easy for me to say. Um, what kind of suspicion? Um, you know, just shady kind of activity. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> shady suspicion. <laughs> Well, I'm asking for a legal term because, uh, you know, we all have our own suspicions. And if we were able to just stop people just based on whatever, you know, alcoholic suspicion, um, uh, what kind? What does the law require? Somebody has said it. Reasonable. Go ahead, say it again. Reasonable. Okay. So is somebody's dress reasonable suspicion of criminal activity? Who said yes? Who said no? Just raise your hand if you said no. Okay. We go down, pass the mic down here. Down to her in the. No, I don't think it's racial profiling or um, suspicion. Why, why isn't um, the way somebody's dressed reasonable suspicion? Because we live in a free country. We can dress the way we want. Anybody can. Okay. I, I don't buy a bad wall, but if I came in a huge hoodie and big sweatpants, the thoughts held a bad day. I wanted to be in sweatpants. <laughs> so now I'm going to be sweatpants. Are you saying that people who wear hoodies and uh, baggy sweatpants are having a bad day? No. <laughs> Are you saying that means you're having a bad day? Okay. Because sometimes some of my best days are when I was wearing a hoodie and jeans. <laughs> okay. All right. Appreciate that. Now, we're trying to be fair. Now, isn't there a time when clothing could be reasonable suspicion? Is there ever a time or is it just never? Is there ever a time? Who? Who would say? Uh, oh, hold on. We're going get to get you to the mic. Uh huh. Go ahead. If you're, I don't know, flying or whatever, and you're going through airport security, and you look like, you know, suspicious. <laughs> Obviously, maybe that would be a reason to check somebody out. You know, if somebody comes in with a huge hoodie on, and We're I don't back know, to the hoodie. And like, we're back to the hoodie again, huh? I guess, but I could, I could see why for like airport security reasons why that might be suspicious. But I don't understand it on like a street. That's stupid. I can understand it. I'm just saying I can understand it for like security reasons because of what goes on in the airports or what has happened, you know. Okay, well we're going to get to the airports in another minute, but right now we're we're on the street because that's a whole that opens up a whole other subject we're going to get to later. Uh, pass it down here. No, 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 because everybody has to be able to hear it. No, no, I just you know. So basically, people are saying like if it doesn't mean. You're not addressing like society wants you to, you're going to be profiled. That's basically what everyone's saying. We'll have to try to be nice about it. You're being nice about it. Yeah. Okay. Y'all don't have to be nice here. Okay. There's one thing I'm still trying to get at, and I was thinking that I already I got a hand over here, so I'll come back through, that the criminal justice people might be the ones to pick up on. Come on. Is there ever a time when what somebody's wearing could be reasonable suspicion? Is there ever a time? Hands should be flying. No? I hope you have the answer after I walked all the way over uh, here. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about something completely different. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. We'll get back to it. Who has the other answer? Uh, clothing and reasonable doubt. Uh, I think the common perception in poverty. Like, I'll get Common perception in poverty, like you, when you think of like the slums or the ghetto or something like that, you think of people who don't have enough money, and people who don't have enough money can't buy normal clothes. So right off the bat, they're probably going down to save a lot or savers or something like that. You know, I I do it. I buy all my clothes from savers, but uh, only pants though. Only pants. But but you're normal, right? Yeah, I'm a normal person. It's okay, just, okay. It's, it's, a, it's a common perception of like what everybody may think. I guess, yeah, uh, everybody has their own perception of it, but. 
Okay, now I'm going to ask the question that everybody wanted to know. You said people who don't have a lot of money um, can't buy normal clothes. So I'm, I'm trying well, to figure out what um, are the pants upside down or well, you know. I'll give you another example. Uh, okay. I have a, I have a personal example. My sister. Um, we're on camera here, so just remember that. Okay. Well, anyways, uh, you know, I had a family member, and uh, she lives down in the south end of New Bedford. She doesn't have a lot of money all the time, so she's always wearing you know, um, ragged out clothes or baggy clothes. And uh, a lot of the people that are around there were usually wearing the same thing. And plus, the neighborhood that she lives in has a lot of drugs, crime, uh, police activity. I'm always down there, so I see it. So it's kind of like the common perception of, like, when you see someone dressed a certain way uh, that doesn't look like he fits in with, uh, like, going to a mall or something like that, you know, it, it's like right off the bat, you're thinking okay. poverty. Or I got whatever. it. I got Drugs, it. Yeah. Alcohol. Uh, one thing was it, it wasn't anything that you said that gave reasonable suspicion. I mean, even somebody who shows up who's dressed in a different way than everybody else does not give reasonable suspicion. But I'm trying to get from a time when a time when clothing could add up to reasonable suspicion. Now, I'm going to send it all the way back over there because I don't want to run all the way around there. Send it over to see the guy in the red shirt at the end. Sorry. Well, the point I was trying to make relates to uh, gangs and organized crime. Uh, certain, wearing certain colors in a certain area could be reasonable, reasonable suspicion for a certain behavior. If it's also associated with certain behaviors. Say if a uh, local department knows that the East Street gang typically wears green, bright green jerseys and frequents the East Street neighborhood. Uh, officer in the area might see a group all wearing uh, bright green jerseys on a corner on East Street might have reasonable, reasonable suspicion, but it should be based more on uh, behavior than the appearance of the individuals. Okay, so I think you answered your own question because you were saying that those things should be based on reasonable suspicion, so you were actually saying that those colors do not create reasonable suspicion. No, I'm saying, well, I'm sorry. Well, then you were saying, making a contradictory uh, statement. I mean, you were getting close to the answer. The thing is, in my neighborhood, uh, one set, there's a set in my neighborhood that wears a certain color bandana. Now, the stores all around there sell all the colors of bandanas. So if somebody goes and buys that certain color bandana, it doesn't have, that doesn't create reasonable suspicion. A person has a right to sell it. A person has a right to buy it and wear it. Now, if an officer suspects that somebody wearing a bandana might be in a set, what was it that the 27-year veteran from the police force, who is now the monitor, said should be done rather than just running up to that person and searching them? What did he say? He said, call the surveillance unit and tell them to keep an eye on somebody. And then look for what? See if they're doing something. See, look for signs of criminal activity. The whole point is that this shorthanded way of investigating is wasting a lot of time. That officer following somebody and questioning them without seeing evidence of a crime is missing out on a lot of stuff. And we'll get into more of that later, but I want to start on the PowerPoint, but I will just give the answer. There are times when clothing is so unique and the situation is so serious that what the person wearing could be, could be unusual or unique enough. So let's say there's just been a robbery and somebody is wearing a bright green hoodie. At that point, that could be reasonable suspicion to detain the person because the sweater or hoodie is unusual enough in the community to allow for an officer to investigate. And so I have, uh, I've had an APB out for someone in a bright green hoodie and I want to know if any of my investigators here can identify that person or a potential suspect. Anybody here? Anybody in this room fits that description for detention purposes. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the gentleman over here, the Caucasian gentleman over here with the green hoodie, okay? But he would, be, he would be able to be questioned as to whether he was a suspect or not, but he wouldn't be able to be profiled and no one else would just because everyone is wearing a hoodie. It just depends on how common it is in the community. So, 
anybody here well let me tell you the story about elmo randolph is a young black man that did everything that society wants he went to high school he never had any trouble with the law he graduated he went to undergrad never had any trouble with the law got very good grades finished undergrad decided that he wanted to further his education he went to dental school he got a dental degree never had any trouble with the law and eventually became a dentist and because he was such a conscientious student when he opened up an office within a couple of years as a young man he was a very successful dentist in new jersey so he rewarded himself for his years of staying on the right side of the law and for doing his studies well and practicing dentistry to the point that he was very successful at a young age he bought himself a gold lexus that was the first mistake he ever made in his life he bought himself a gold lexus what do you think happened to him going up and down the new jersey turnpike he got pulled over over 100 times it was never given a warning a citation or any arrest and he was searched over 100 times in the course of a few years it got to the point where it put all kinds of effects on him that were like post-traumatic stress disorder but we'll just leave it there so I want to ask here with a show of hands is there anyone here who knows somebody who believes that they were racially profiled by law enforcement is there anyone here who knows somebody who says that they were racially profiled by law enforcement we don't know it it's what the person said we would have to assess the person and know hold your hands up okay keep them up is there anybody here who themselves take your hands out is there anybody here who themselves believes that they were a victim of racial profiling by law enforcement would you like to say something about it a little something okay Now, we do all have the right to remain silent, but remember, you don't get any points for class participation <laughs> if you assert your right to remain silent here. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. I like your shirt, by the way. Thank you. You got a nice shirt, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so many times, like, you know, just doing nothing, just walking down the street. I remember this one time, I was over at my dad's house. You know, we live in Boston. So um, I just left everything, just got out the shower, threw on a couple of clothes. I had a white hoodie on and a tank top. And uh, I think I had on some blue jeans at the time. So I just left. I'm on my way to get a steak and cheese. <laughs> I'm walking up the street. I go right around the corner. I see the uh, detectives in this car with the black tents on them. And they're just riding by and they look at me. I'm looking at the car, they're looking at me. I'm looking at the car, they're looking at me. So it's a one-way street, and I'm walking up to go to Simcoe's, get a steak and cheese right quick, you know what I'm saying? He mentioned that twice, all right. Where are the col <laughs> hey, where are my culinary people? We need to hook him up, all right? Right afterwards. So yeah, as I turn the corner, they hop out on me. Guns out, guns drawn. Mm. Task Force, Special Detectives, Gang Unit. Three officers, guns out on me. All right, where's the gun? Where's the gun? I'm like, whoa, you know, don't shoot. You know, I'm not doing anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm not involved with nothing. You know, I'm just on my way to the steak and cheese. Feed him. So, you know, they hop out. They're like, all right, this is what they said to me. You know, they, they hop down cursing and swearing at me. You know, I'm not going to say what they said to me, but. You know, it's just real life, it happened to me. And they're like, all right, where's the crack? Where's the guns? Where's the cash at? I'm like, whoa, this is what they said to me. You know, and I'm not doing anything, I'm on my way up the street. So he's like, yeah, you know, the guy's going all over me, trying to get, trying to find something. He's like, do you have anything on you? I'm like, no, you know what I'm saying, nothing. You know, I'm not involved in anything. And, uh, you know, they just searched me, and just, Guns out of my face. I'm just like, you know, I had enough and I just spazzed on them. I was like, you guys are way out of line. I didn't, I didn't do anything wrong. Nobody called you or nothing. You guys were just running up on me for nothing. And they apologized. And they said, uh, well, what do you want us to do, man? This area is crazy. There's a lot of stuff going on. What do you expect us to do? You just walked like you had a gun on you. And I was like, wow. That was it, man. Appreciate you telling the story. Give him a hand. I'll tell you, um, 
<laughs> I've, think, I've had things happen to me, too, and it's not easy to talk about. It may seem like it, and there are parts of it that are kind of humorous, but I know why, why we're laughing, because some of the things are ironic they're doing, but it's not easy. Um, uh, how, how, did, how did you feel while it was going on? Man, I felt like, you know, I was being racially profiled. But your emotions, what kind of emotions did you have? I was mad, you know, because it wasn't right, you know what I'm saying? And you don't just do that to people for no reason. And, and how do you feel now? What kind of emotions do you have when you think about it now? Um, you know, I hope it never happens again, you know? And, um, you know, I just make sure, you know, I get a ride going to get a steak and cheese. Like <laughs> <laughs> we gonna give him a steak and cheese. For what he went through, he should get lifetime steak and cheese. And I'm saying that, and I'm a vegetarian, okay? So, um, uh, and what's your point of view if you see, whether you're in Boston or other places, has it had any effect when you see uh, officers come by, when you see police come by? Has there any, been any difference, or are things the same? Uh, I just, you know, just got to keep it moving, you know? They do what they do. I got to do what I do. Okay, appreciate it. Give them another hand. Um, One of the things that he described in there, and if you, will follow, if you will follow the writings of Dr. Robert Carter from Columbia University, who has written about the effects of racial discrimination on people of color, and he also includes racial profiling as part of his description. And one of the effects is avoidance. So now you have somebody who has a right to walk down the street to get a, to get a, and now he says he gets a ride. That's called avoidance. Yeah. There are communities where people have completely, like some American Indians that I worked with, uh, the Lakota Nation in South Dakota, the sheriffs were profiling them when the Bureau of Indian Affairs tickets came. That's when the, the money that the government set aside for taking their land and giving them reservations so they get a monthly check. It's not welfare, it's payments for the taking of land by the US government. When those checks came in every month, the sheriffs set up roadblocks around the reservation and just started wiling out, pulling over um, Indians left and right, left and right, writing them tickets because they knew that that cash was coming in for their little towns. So what happened was an entire tribe, an entire reservation of people drove, instead of just taking the state highway straight to the shopping mall, they started going through all these back roads, car after car, following dirt roads and going through fields and everything, working their way all the way around, an extra half hour of driving just to go shopping when the BIA checks came in. That's crazy. It's called avoidance and it's one of the many symptoms. Thank you for that story and maybe others will have something to share later on. So here are our three main points. Racial profiling is real. Now, I said on one side, there are people that are saying this happening all the time. On the other side, we have police departments saying it never happens. I'm the chief here. My officers never, would never do anything like that. So we have two extremes. In some place, there's this area in the middle, and that area in the middle is real. Racial profiling is going on. It's illegal, and it doesn't work. It's ineffective policing. And third, we have to end it. I don't spend time anymore talking about things and just describing the problem. Oh, it's bad. Here it is. What, what are we going to do about it? We're just going to let things happen? This is true for whatever you're working on. Don't just get the information, but figure out a way to put it into practice to try to move towards the ends that you want. So the first thing, of course, is to define racial profiling. And one of the things that has happened is there's been a little bit of conversation about how you define it. If you define something in a way that it can make the problem appear to disappear. So one of the things is that the first definitions that came out were racial profiling, and we call this a narrow one, is when police take law enforcement activity solely on the basis of the person's race or ethnicity. So that was a definition that went out for a while, but there was a problem with it because the departments were saying, we never stop, search, investigate, frisk, arrest anybody solely on the basis of race. We don't only do it because of race. And so they were saying there was no racial profiling going on. So then we started to go back and we came up with a broader definition. And that is racial profiling is when police conduct police activity, whatever type it is, that uses race or ethnicity as one of several factors. And when we did that, it began to include the possibilities of other kinds of stops instead of when people just did it based on race. So what kind of examples could there be where it was done on the basis of two things, neither of which re uh, reached the level of reasonable suspicion? Anybody? 
So you stop, think of the video. You stop somebody because they're black and what? The way they dress. They're black and what? The way they dress. Here, go ahead, pass that down. I want everybody to hear that. And the way they dress. Right. <laughs> Any other examples? You can uh, just raise your hand if you have other examples. Yeah, go ahead. What they're driving. What they're driving. Okay, dress, driving. Any others? Uh, where they are. Where they are, such as? Uh, like they go to the parking lot and there's like a McDonald's or something that probably needs to have it in, so you're not doing anything wrong and the police don't stop you. Okay, so, um, so we kind of call that geographic criminality, where now all of a sudden the Constitution has shifted a little bit. It's not a reasonable suspicion or probable cause against an individual, it's reasonable suspicion or probable cause of a geographic area, which means that even if a dog walked into that area, then all of a sudden the dog qualifies to be investigated for reasonable suspicion. Hey, maybe he's biting people and shouldn't be. Now, we are looking at that definition and began to see that it was those kinds of things that were combined that some officers were doing. And so we use the broader, we use the broader description. Now, what kind of police actions are covered? A lot of times people just kind of talk about stops and questioning and, and um, things like that, but it also covers searches. It covers arrests. It covers handcuffing. It covers disrespect. It covers all levels of violence from shoving to beating. And it covers all kinds of weapons from nightsticks to tasers to guns. And it also covers serious injury and death. Any police activity which is done in the absence of the required reasonable suspicion or the required threat and where race is in the combination and it's done in a way that is racially different. So one group of people have one kind of activity and another group get treated differently. That's racial profiling. Here's an example. Uh, I had a conversation in a meeting like this and the officer said, look, we have the right to handcuff anybody for officer safety. I said, you do. And what gives you that right? What amendment allows um, an officer to do things like that? It's part of the Fourth Amendment. It's part of the Fourth Amendment. But there's another amendment, too, that says if you have a right to handcuff everyone, but the only people that you handcuff are people of color in, quote, certain neighborhoods, now, all of a sudden, you're not doing the Fourth Amendment in an equal way. You're treating some people differently than others. And what amendment does that fall under? I'm hoping that our criminal justice folks eventually learn all of the amendments that apply here. Which one? Fourteenth. Here, pass it up to him. Fourteenth. Yeah, and what does the fourteenth say? I mean, bas basically. You have to judge everybody the same way. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Equal protection under the law. That's one that many people miss. That even if you have a right to remove people from a vehicle, you can't just remove black suspects from the vehicle because you think that they, meaning all, them, they do things worse than other people, so you get to remove this one. Your suspicion has to apply to that individual and only that individual. And so the treatment can't be different. Uh, here's one example where those tactics are, are applying. This is, this is a report that you can get online. It's talking about the increase in SWAT teams all across the country. More and more of these teams are being formulated and there seems to be financial pressure because many of the military corporations are talking to the Department of Justice and getting them to buy a lot of this stuff. And once they have it, they're using it. And they're using it for raids even where they don't have any suspicion that a military type raid is necessary. And it's causing a lot of breaking in to wrong homes and uh, shooting of people because of the attitude that accompanies the raids. And before you think this is an ACLU or one of these liberal publications, this is put out by the Cato Institute, which is a very conservative organization. And they're also worried about the way that police are beginning to use tactics in situations where it's not called for. So we have different types of racial profiling. For a long time, it was called DWB. Um, anybody know what that means? Anybody ever heard that before? Go ahead, say it. Driving while black. While black and brown. 
And uh, there are other forms of it too. We all call that all traditional racial profiling. Unfortunately, so many new kinds have been added that now the old kind has now become traditional, sort of the one that's been around in America for a long time. So there's also WWB. Anybody know what that is? And don't say a wrestling federation. WWB. So what would be? D would be driving. What could W be? Walking. And how about BWB? Biking. Biking. Yes. Believe it or not, we had a little town that was near Chicago, that was next to Chicago. And in that little town where there were many more white people than black people, unlike Chicago, which was the other way around, bicycles started turning up missing. And so the police chief in this little town sent a memo out, which we got through our lawsuit. And the memo was telling the police officers that because of the bikes that were being stolen, officers were now instructed to stop all black youth on bicycles near the border between the two towns to question them about where their bikes came from. Now, kids between the ages of 12 and probably 16, uh, mostly uh, 14 and 15, suddenly had police cars jumping out and the police walking up to them and saying, all right, where'd you get this bicycle? You imagine a 12 year old kid going, <laughs> didn't give an answer. Officer took the bike, put it in the trunk and just drove away. Wow. No record of it, no receipt. No suspicion, no charges, just took the bicycles. So we sued on behalf of a dozen of them. And we got a settlement out of it because you don't just put out a memo that says stop all people of one race because something has happened. Anybody ever heard of a memo going like that in a white neighborhood? Bikes are missing, so now stop all the white kids. All the white kids. Oh, those parents would be down there so quickly. So anyway, we have post 9-11 racial profiling. Anybody know anything about any race, are there any Arab Muslim or South Asian students here? Okay, 9-11 profiling. Uh, terrible thing happens, these buildings come down, thousands of people die, we just had the 10th anniversary of that. Are there any kinds of things that anybody heard or read about that federal law enforcement did? I'm gonna see if there's someone else because you've been answering well, but I might have to come to you. Come on folks, what, what happened? What kind of things went on afterwards? What happened to Arabs and Muslims and South Asians? Anything? Hold on. You security in the airports? Yeah, security in the airports, but I'm saying things that happened particularly to Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians. Did anything happen to Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians in the airport that was different than other people? Um, they were probably patted down and searched before they got on a plane. Good answer. Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians were targeted for extra security and extra searches just because they were Arab or Muslim, and not because some word had gotten out that they were suspected of doing anything, but just because of their race or ethnicity. So they did this to us. They, that great entire group of people. Go ahead. Um, also, like I know that like restaurants in New York, when it came to um, the Arabs or Muslims or whatever, that they were like cops were going in there and like you know like yelling at them and just being really like rude to them and stuff because of what happened like days after the event happened, even though they had nothing to do with it. Most definitely, a lot of bad treatment, including by a lot of, a lot of individuals. And I'm asking about law enforcement here, too. So, so what do they do? Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Um, the possible terrorists got treated unfairly. OK. But, Pe um, <laughs> people were subjected to treatment in prisons that is not even allowed, not even a level that's allowed here. So here's some of the things that happened. The FBI started rounding up Arabs without any suspicion that the individual Arabs that were being rounded up had any affiliations or had ever done anything suspicious. They required registration of Arabs and Muslims from other countries without any suspicion of those individuals at all, whatsoever, that there was anything that pointed to these individual people that they all now had to come in and register. Is there anybody, well listen, this was a bad time. A lot of people died. The country is in fear. Doesn't that justify these kinds of things? Is there anybody who can defend this to say we have to protect the country? Is there anybody that nobody feels that this is something that we have to do? I'm not trying to set you up. I just want to hear another point of view. Okay. Well, that's a big question. Some people brought up in, in another one of the uh, sessions that it was done to the Japanese after World War II. The Japanese were rounded up in that same way, including Japanese citizens, people who were born here. So, 
Oh, I know one more thing. What was the worst, what was the worst terrorist attack on American soil as of September 10th, 2001? What was the worst terrorist attack on American soil as of September 10, 2001? Pearl Harbor. Ah, you know what? A lot of people have been answering that, so I have to change the question. What was the worst one on American soil since 2001? I'm going to come up here. See, people are sharp, you know, they're holding me to uh, the way I'm asking my questions. Pass it down. I believe in 1993, um, there was also an attack in the World Trade Center um, by, I believe, Muslims, Arabs, Muslim people. But um, it was attacked 18 years prior, and I guess that sort of increased the awareness towards it. And people started to associate those things together. How many people died in 93? Uh, hmm? Anybody know? Okay. Oh, there's a few. Well, that's a good answer, but that's not the, um, that's not the biggest terrorist attack. Go ahead, say it again. Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Give them a hand. And uh, tell me something about the characteristics of those who were ultimately convicted of that attack. Caucasian. Anything else about them? What's that? Sandy hair, Caucasian. Anything else? How about gender? Male. So, and how about age range? 60s? Teenagers? 20s. White males in their 20s. And tell me what kinds of things did the federal government do after that attack? Did they round up white men for questioning who were 20, in their 20s? Did they force any of the white men from other countries or even from the US to have special registration? Why not? Why did they treat one group differently from the other group? As of September 10th, this was the worst. A hundred and some people died. That was a terrible thing. Why didn't that kind of activity happen? Well, somebody tell me why. I mean, I'm asking for, I'm really trying to figure it out to this day. Does any, anyone have any ideas why? <coughs> Still nobody's saying, but come on, we have to think of a reason. What do you think the reason is? He's a homegrown terrorist. He was actually born here, raised here, served in the military here. And he wasn't from another country or anything like that. But I'm just well, it's a good try, but a lot of the Arabs, Muslims, and South Asians that were rounded up here were people who were born here. No, no, but, uh, but they weren't the ones who actually did it. I'm saying he, he did it, and he was a homegrown terrorist. But... I don't know the details of the previous ones exactly, so I don't want to talk about those. But I know 9-11, they, they weren't born in the U.S. So that, might, that would definitely be a contributing factor. But I'm talking about the fact that Arabs and Muslims that were born here were rounded up and they were questioned. They were stopped in vehicles in cities all over the country. Whenever they were riding in trucks, they were pulled over and their trucks were opened up and they were searched. Did any, any trucks around the country with white men in them get pulled over and searched in, countries, in, in cities all over the country? Go ahead. I think they, uh, I think they have the federal government actually already has the, uh, how do you say, dos dossiers on a lot of the um, terrorists that do live here in the United States that they do know about um, outside terrorism is something that scares us because we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know exactly who it is. You know, we were, during 9-11, during we got mad at, at all these uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Most of the terrorists were Saudi Arabian, which is a friend of the United States. Uh, you know, it's, we don't know where the terrorism is coming from when it comes from out, when it comes from people out of the United States. In the United States, I, I think the federal government do, does have kind of an eye on a lot of the terrorists that I uh, hear, a lot of the really far right-wing groups that are out there and stuff like that. Yeah, but I'm trying to figure out one thing. If they had all this idea about who they were and where they were, how did they bomb the Oklahoma City building then? So you're saying, well, the reason why they're doing it is because they don't have much on these people over here, but they have all this information on these people. But these people that they had all the information on got bombed. But I'm trying to make a, I'm trying to make a point here. 
we, we, we try to look at why things that happen get differential treatment. And it might be that the elephant in the room is that when you have a society and a government that is majority white, are you gonna say that? Yeah. Okay, well here, go ahead. I should have waited and let you say it. I'm trying to kill time when I'm walking up the steps. I should just shut up. Uh, pretty much like the uh, white people weren't rounded up and made to register because white people are a majority in America and what are you gonna do? Round up every single person in the town? But in the other sense, that's what they did for a lot of Japanese people during World War II. And it's, it's completely unfair. It's like, well, why can you do that to someone who was born here, but is of a different skin color, but you can't do it to the majority? Okay, he, he might be onto something. If anyone can explain other reasons why, I mean, one of the things we ask law enforcement to do is how do they justify their practices, whether it's regular profiling, in other words, just profiling on the basis of criminal activity or profiling on the basis of race or ethnicity. But what did you say? I said majority rules. <laughs> might be might what we have here. When you're in the majority, you don't tend to think collectively for political, I mean, for a criminal responsibility, you tend not to think of your entire group when you're in the majority as potentially criminal. The way you can when you look at a group that in your own mind is different from you and outside of you, it may be easier in order to do that. And that's come up with some of the conversations we've had with law enforcement officers about why they think this practice goes on. And that also includes officers of color. Um, and so more recently now, we're starting to see uh, immigration status profiling where a sheriff in Arizona in their Arpaio says that any time that a person who looks like they're not from this country is going to be questioned about their immigration status whenever they get pulled over for a traffic violation. Now, how you look like you're from another country, I'm not really sure, unless you're wearing a soccer shirt that says Mexico or something like that. So, and the thing about it is, uh, who here remembers their history? California, Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona were part of what country before it became part of the United States? I know you know. Where? Say it. Mexico. We're part of Mexico. So the brown people who were living on that land became, before it became the United States, when it became the United States, they automatically became what? American. American citizens. And so they've been here longer than some of the people that are rounding them up, and I'm sure they've been on that land longer than Sheriff Arpaio is. So there's no basis for him to target people. The last one is hip hop profiling, that on the basis of music and lyrics, without proof of criminal activity, using the lyrics themselves, uh, uh, rappers have been targeted. And I worked with Uncle Luke. Anybody remember um, Luther Campbell, Luke Skywalker from Two Live Crew? He was having problems with police surveilling the artists that were coming to Miami for his hip hop weekend. And we got the dossier they had put together and it turns out that most of the people in there, in fact, um, very few of the people in there, did they have any suspect, suspicion of criminal activity. They were just doing surveillance on all rappers because, well, listen to their lyrics, listen to the things they say. If that's the case, all the Sopranos should be profiled. Have you seen any of the articles about how many of them have criminal records? The cast of the Sopranos? Anyway, I'm not in favor of that either. This is ODB's mother here in the center of the picture. I was on a panel with her where she believes that her son was profiled to death. He was in a vehicle, and any of you, how many people are familiar with ODB from Wu? Okay, good, good. So, you know, at certain times he was having certain stresses, and at one point in time he got pulled over by a police officer in New York City who had no suspicion of traffic violation. There was no suspicion of criminal activity by ODB or his crew. There were no outstanding warrants. He hadn't broken any traffic violations. He just knew it was ODB's car. And hey, let's just check him out and let's just see what we find out. Let's just see if anything comes up. Well, uh, Dirty had been having some paranoia. And so when the officer came up and he knew he hadn't done anything wrong, he was really worried about what was getting ready to happen. And so he drove away. He made a mistake. He did. He drove away. He pulled away and the officer immediately pulled out his service revolver and started shooting into the vehicle. Hadn't seen a weapon, hadn't smelled drugs, nothing. Just started shooting. So the car went out of control, and it ended up in front of his aunt's house. 
And he ended up getting arrested and charged with a lot of things around evading, even though there was no reasonable suspicion for him to be stopped in the first place. So he went to prison. And while in prison, because of the emotional situations that he was having and that some of his meds weren't being given to him, he was being denied his meds, he ended up in the psychiatric ward. And as she told me and told the people at the panel, when he came out, he was never the same. And that ended up being the consequence of his ultimately dying, which I believe was almost a form of, a form of suicide. But the but for was the fact that if this officer hadn't stopped him for no reason, caused him to flee with his mental distress, shot up the vehicle, ended up with all the drama that he ended up with all these charges, went into the psych ward, came out a broken person. So there are consequences to it, even um, in the hip hop profiling. So racial profiling is a nationwide problem. We have the stories. I told you about Elmo Randolph. We heard, what's your name? Dennis. Dennis. We heard Dennis's story. And we look at the, we gather evidence in other ways as well. We look at polls and we look at data. So we've told, talked about the stories. Maybe we have some time. I'll tell you about some of the other people who have been through this too. So Gallup did a poll that asked people whether racial profiling is widespread. And they looked in three places, uh, motorists on roads, passengers at security checkpoints, and shoppers in malls. And the numbers were very high, including for Caucasians who believe that it's widespread. Now, it's not, the question wasn't, do you think it's going on or it happens from time to time? Do you believe it's widespread? People form their opinions based on their own experiences and the experiences of people around them and other things they learn. So these polls are very valuable in saying that examples and evidence of the problem is trickling to the point where it's co becoming common knowledge to people all around the country. Racial profiling is based on false assumptions. The first, people of color are the majority of drug users and sellers. Truth, each racial group uses and sells drugs in proportion to its percentage of the population, which means if you take a pie, and a pie, this is the pie of the population of black people, this is the pie of the population of Latino people, and this is the pie of the population of white people. In each pie, what percentage, how big a slice within that group are drug users and sellers. And here's what we found. The red line going across uh, represents blacks, the blue line whites, the black line Latinos, the green line Asians. And this is tracking drug use between the years of 2002 and 2010. And at the time they were surveying, they were asking, uh, how many of you have used drugs within the last month? And look at the percentages. 10.7, 9.1, 8.1. The numbers are tracked very closely together. So in each pie, the percentage of people who are using drugs is very close to the same. And there's other government information that shows that, and this of course makes sense, is that people buy drugs from people who look like them. Because if a whole stream of white people were going into the black community to buy drugs, that would really raise a lot of flags, wouldn't it? And if a whole lot of black people were going into the white community to raise to buy uh, drugs, that would raise flags too. So people tend to work within their own racial and cultural and social networks. And so if that's the case, why is it that 70% of the arrests for drugs are of people of color and 30% are of whites, when in reality, 70% of the population is white and 70% of the drug using population is white and 30% of the population is people of color. Anybody have any theory on why that, those numbers would be flipped? Anyone? Any theories at all? So it, it just happens. Is it natural? Is it just the way things go? Where? Am I missing a hand? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to pass that to her. Um, I, I think it's a consequence of American history. And this type of racism has existed throughout history, and it's just one more, one more way it's being expressed. Is this? It's clear. It's clear that rate was your hand up over here? Okay. It's clear that racism plays a role, you know, and, and in the history of it. Also, one of the reasons why is because a lot of law enforcement agencies believe the stereotype. Um, I believe that it's a, lo a lot of times that because employers will, will hire, um, say, a, a young white gentleman before they'll hire a 
a, a black gentleman, and they end up there in poverty-stricken areas. They turn to other other means of supporting themselves or their family, and that's how they a lot of times end up selling drugs. Yeah, except for one thing, all of the groups are using and selling drugs at the same rate, whether they're in rich areas, suburban areas, wherever. So we're trying to figure out why. And some police department said, well, you know, people of color, they're out, out in the open, it's easier to do. And I've never found any reason why it's any harder to park a car or an undercover car in a suburban area and watch people going in and out of a house all day and all night and keep track of what's going on. And then we looked in the urban areas to say, is it really true? And we found, for example, in Seattle, that in the open air drug markets in downtown Seattle, um, it wasn't mostly blacks and Latinos who were there buying drugs. It was mostly whites, but it was the blacks and Latinos that were being followed and targeted. So it didn't have to do with where the market was. But these are the kinds of things that we try to point out. People of color commit most crime. Here's the truth. Corporate and white collar crime are not investigated or prosecuted as heavily as street crime, even though they cost victims and taxpayers billions of dollars more than street crime. So we have police putting a priority on so-called street crime, and they collect that data on how many of those kinds of crimes take place. Department of Justice doesn't collect any data on corporate crime, even though right now we've had the Enron accounting fraud. Now we've had the major banks and financial institutions who have now fraudulently sold mortgages and derivative securities to the point where $13 trillion has been pulled out of the, out of the country's economy fraudulently and yet they still don't track how much of this is going on. And the cost through the surveys that are done by the Department of Justice is that $30 billion a year approximately is the cost to society of street crime. And the American Society of Fraud Examiners says that the cost of corporate crime, which is mainly done by high level people and not just people taking boxes out the back door, costs 6% of gross domestic product. Any accounting people here? Any financial people here? What is gross domestic product? Anyone know? Gross domestic product is all the money that's made by the US, all the businesses combined. If all the businesses reported how much they all made, that's the gross domestic product. And it's in trillions of dollars. And so 6% of that would mean that corporate crime is costing us at least a trillion dollars a year, which is a whole lot more than 30 billion. And yet, no focus is being put on that as opposed to just looking at street crime. And some people will say, well, street crime costs lives. You know, we have to protect lives and, and cause personal injury. But I will say to you that corporate crime also takes lives and also causes injury. There are people, and this is foreseeable, even the judge when Kenneth Lay from Enron was sentenced, talked about the number of people that were going to die as a result of losing their life savings and not being able to get the medical care that they needed. If it's foreseeable for a young man who goes into a store with a gun, if it's foreseeable for him that somebody could die, and if it's foreseeable that someone who goes in to rob with him that didn't even know there's a gun, it's found that it was foreseeable for him that somebody could die, then it should be foreseeable that people with MBAs who are high-level corporate executives who are doing things like taking people's mortgage money and getting them to buy investments that they know are fraudulent, it should be foreseeable for people with advanced degrees who went to Ivy League schools that people are going to die as a result of their criminal activity. And yet there's very few prosecutions and there's very much attention paid to it. Any idea why? Well, who are these people? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, they're, all the, they're all the rich people. And obviously, would you ever go after someone who's rich? Can they just slip you like a couple million dollars say be quiet? Well, when, they, when you say slip a couple of million, I mean, it's not like we're saying that they're bribing people, but what are they doing? What, what, are, what, are these, what did these wealthy banks do in the last election? What'd they do? They actually tend to vote. The corporations just take them out without using their hands. Well, what, what, did the cor what did corporations are they able to do when it comes time to elections and campaigns? What do they do? Vote. What's that? Vote. Well, we're, we're talking about money. What do they do with their money? They make campaign contributions. The banks made huge campaign contributions. You think that has any effect on whether the Department of Justice or whether politicians are going to say, hey, the same people that just gave me $100,000 need to be locked up for three strikes, you're out, and zero tolerance. No, that's not a good way to get more contributions. 
So that's my theory. If you have another one, you can raise your hand and say why. But I believe that wealth is having an effect here. Okay. So now let's get to the, let's get to the data. This is the last area where we have measured this. So in my work with the ACLU, in the position I was in before this, it was my job to get states and cities to collect data, and then once they put it out, to try to gather it and see what we found out. So through the years, 22 states have collected stop and search data by race. Uh, it represents over 4,000 cities and 6,000 police departments have now gathered this kind of information. And in Massachusetts, this was done through the racial and gender profiling study that was done by the Executive Office of Public Safety. That's the, that's the state agency that's in charge of law enforcement. And they hired Northeastern University to do this kind of research. And here's some of the things that they came up with. And, and I was fortunate to be part of the advocacy and community groups who, who met every month to look at the data and find out what it, what it said. 249 law enforcement agencies in Massachusetts had substantial disparities. 141 had substantial disparities in resident drivers by race compared to resident driver population. 201 agencies had racial disparities, significant racial disparities in citations. And out of 87 communities that had enough searches to be statistically significant, 40 had significant disparities around searches. And so they looked at those four areas they looked at citations by residents, citations compared to the population of people who use the roads in those areas. They looked at searches and they looked at warnings. And they broke them into categories. Which cities had significant disparities in all four of those areas? Resident citations, citations compared to the driving population, searches, and warnings versus citations. There were two cities in this area there was one city in this area and the city of Boston that had uh, shown racial profiling in the four major areas, and that was Boston and New Bedford. Now, cities that, had, that showed racial profiling in three areas from this region, Bridgewater. Cities that showed racial profiling in two of the four areas, Fall River. And cities that showed racial profiling in one of the four areas. This is significant racial profiling in one of the four areas, Attleboro. So you can go to this report, and this is the executive summary, but you can go to the major report, and you can take a look at other cities that you're interested in and find out what happened. And this also mirrored what happened all over the country, because in looking at over 50 of these studies, we found again and again the same kind of significant disparities in many of the cities. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these. Um, last one. Uh, we heard Dennis's story. Why do we want to end racial profiling? People are less likely to cooperate with the police. Anybody who's going into law enforcement is not going to want to go into a community of color where prior officers have been racial profiling because you're not going to get any help. And after 9-11, you can be sure that there are a lot of Arabs and Muslims that I've talked to who said they'll never cooperate with the police because they're worried about what might happen to them. And a lot of immigrants are saying, we're not going to do the same thing because we don't like the way we're treated. That makes it very hard. Most law enforcement crimes are solved through cooperation by citizens. It's not, yeah, forensics is part of it, but TV kind of overplays the role forensics plays. Uh, data can show that a department is being open and is treating people well. And the last point is that you don't want people going around the community who are showing symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder because they have been profiled. They make for people who are unstable and unpredictable, and they can start doing things like walking around the corner when they're wearing their hoodie in Cincinnati because they know that they're going to get stopped and questioned for no reason, and hopefully I can get around the corner before this officer comes up and does that to me. So solutions. Learn about conditions in your community. Know your rights and teach others. This is wh whether we're talking about race or anything else, you need to know your rights. Stand up for your rights. Say no to consent searches. Set up cop watch programs where police activities are monitored is perfectly legal. And also call for data collection by all police departments and get the data. The data that was collected as a result of the Massachusetts study is just sitting somewhere because they didn't authorize any money for it to be even looked at. So we can't even go further and find out what's going on now. 
pass federal laws against racial profiling. So thank you. I, and thank you all. Thank you all for taking part. Now I made a little note up here because my project tries to um, make available um, interns. I wish I had money, I don't. Internships, I write good recommendations and uh, whether there's possibilities for independent studies. Some schools have that or not. So if you're any interested, take down the email address and let me know. Thank you.